Hi everyone, and welcome to Windsor Cope's monthly meeting. I am Diana Borges, the Windsor Cope community leader, and I'm also a registered geologist with the state of California. I am gonna be the speaker tonight talking about earthquake preparedness and response. And first I wanna start off by you know, giving you some background, a little information on uh, earthquakes so you'll understand more how and why to prepare for them. And I'm gonna start by sharing my screen and playing this YouTube video. It's a uh, video by National Geographic called Earthquakes 101. From above, the planet appears eerily stiff. But every mountain range and every chasm on its face is a scar, with many telling the story of when the Earth crumbled to life. Earthquakes occur around the world. They've been recorded on all seven continents, but most quakes take place in just three regions the Mid Atlantic Ridge, an underwater line that runs down the Atlantic Ocean, Mute. the Alpine Belt, which stretches from the Mediterranean to Southeast Asia, and the Circum Pacific Belt, which traces along the edges of the Pacific Ocean and oh, is just about all occur. These areas experience the most earthquakes due to what lies beneath the surface. Earthquakes are the result of pressure, specifically pressure caused by extreme stress in the Earth's crust. That stress can be caused by volcanic activity or even man-made activities in certain areas. However, most earthquake-inducing stress is caused by the movement of tectonic plates. Tectonic plates are constantly moving, either against, away, along, or underneath each other. But sometimes their edges may catch and stick. The plates, however, continue to move, or at least attempt to. Energy from this attempted movement builds around the edge's sticking point, creating immense pressure until the edges are forced to let go and the plates slip. This causes a sudden and powerful release of energy, so powerful that it breaks the Earth's crust. This fracturing emits shock waves through the ground and causes intense vibrations, or quakes. In fact, the world's most earthquake-prone regions are where the most geologically active plates meet. Earthquakes, or any seismic activity, are recorded by seismographs. When the ground shakes, seismographs oscillate, drawing a jagged line to reflect this movement. The more extreme the earthquake, the greater the height of the jagged line. These recorded motions are then used to measure the earthquake strength or magnitude. While several scales of magnitude exist, the one seismologists prefer is the moment magnitude scale. It has no upper limit and it measures earthquakes logarithmically. This means that each magnitude on its scale is 10 times greater than the one before it. Unlike the now rarely used Richter scale, the moment magnitude scale can be applied globally and can measure quakes of the highest magnitudes. The largest recorded earthquake occurred near Valdivia, Chile in 1960. Nestled within the Circum Pacific Belt, the Valdivia earthquake was the most powerful in a series of quakes that struck the region, measuring at a magnitude of about 9.5. In addition to causing devastating tremors on land, the earthquake also generated a deadly tsunami reaching up to 80 feet high. The tsunami raced across the Pacific Ocean, hitting faraway countries like the Philippines and Japan. In fact, Data from seismographs show that the shock waves emitted by the Valdivia earthquake continued to shake the entire planet for days. Some earthquake prone areas have adapted various ways to protect their communities. Buildings and bridges are designed to sway rather than break when an earthquake occurs. 
the public is educated on how to protect themselves during a seismic event, and government officials enact drills to ensure the protection of their people. Earthquakes can leave behind incredible devastation, but these same forces have also created magnificent features, with each adding character to a planet so unique. Uh, next, I'm going to share my screen and start the PowerPoint. So this is uh, Earthquake Preparedness and Response, and I want to um, kind of drill into us in, in this area that the earthquakes, a uh, large earthquake has potential to cause just as much or more destruction than uh, wildfire in our area. And that might be uh, hard for some to understand, but let me uh, go through the little process. Uh, wildfires generally hit part of our county. And other than situations like the tubs, we have a warning. So we have um, time to respond. Earthquakes, on the other hand, we have no warning for that. And a large earthquake is going to have the potential to impact our entire county and larger areas. So, it has, uh, we don't have the time to repair and it's going to potentially a larger area of destruction. So these are some definitions. I'm not going to go through this. The, the uh, video uh, describes some of those, but a couple things that I do want to point out so that you understand when earthquakes are talked about. Uh, epicenter. Epicenter is not actually where the earthquake occurred. It's the point on the ground surface above where the rupture occurred. And earthquakes, uh, when they occur, they send out these waves. So waves that are within Earth are called body waves. There are two primary ones. The first is a P wave that's sent out. And you can think of that's the primary wave, but it's also a, a seismic wave. It travels faster than the S wave, which is a called secondary wave also. But it's the secondary wave that does the destruction. So when you feel an earthquake and you're going through the thought process, is that an earthquake? I'm not sure what it is. That's the P wave. That's the, the, the one that's not as destructive. And then when the damage hits, that's that P wave that comes in. So the, the travel time between the P and S wave are really only seconds. In a large quake, it might be a minute difference. That's all it is. This is the moment magnitude scale that the video showed. So on the left over here is the magnitude. And magnitudes are reported in a tenths of like a 5.2. Uh, in the middle here is how many of those occur each year worldwide. So if we take, um, say, 6.0, uh, which is what the 2014 Napa quake was, you know, there's 200 of those that occur every year. And as far as the energy that's released, the equivalent was the Hiroshima atomic bomb. So you hear people throwing out also, you know, on social media, especially, uh, there was a 2.5 earthquake, there was a three point earthquake. You know, those are really minor earthquakes. And because we live in such a seismic, like active area, those are occurring very often. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm not concerned with anything below a five, even though, you know, there could be a little bit of damage, but it's, it, it's really insignificant to what potentially can happen in our area. So that was, uh, before was the magnitude of the earthquake. The uh, amount of damage and intensity of the earthquake is, is determined by the modified Mercalli intensity scale. And that is by, you know, how much of the earthquake is felt and also the amount of damage. So you may see, you know, a one to 10 scale of the amount of damage, but the damage will be different um, even from the same earthquake, because in different areas, you're going to feel things differently. So 
So what major faults are in our area? You know, everyone knows, you know, there's the San Andreas Fault out here at the coast, but that's not the one that we really are the most concerned with. Up in here, um, the Mayakama Fault is up here. Um, for reference, here's Cloverdale. Down here, we have the Healdsburg Fault, and down here is the Rogers Creek Fault. Um, this is Roanoke Park, Santa Rosa here. So every major air, uh, town in our county, except for the West County, we are within five miles of the Mayakama Rogers Creek or the Healdsburg Fault. And the USGS, which is the United States Geological Survey, they're the ones that determine, uh, they monitor the earthquakes in the US, has determined that um, for the Bay Area, I mean, that's not just our, um, our county, it's the whole Bay Area, that there's a 72% probability that we're gonna have a 6.7 magnitude or higher. And in our area also, the, the biggest concern fault is this Rogers Creek, which also goes down into, um, if you continue down, uh, and it's about the straight same line, the Hayward Fault is down in there. And there's a 33% chance uh, from, you know, 2014 to 2043 that uh, we're going to have a 6.7 or larger quake. This map also uh, shows liquefaction, and liquefaction is just um, what happens from an earthquake when sediments no longer act um, as one, and they start acting as fluid, liquid, and they things start floating. So it's not it's not um, quicksand, but things will uh, turn into more of a, a fluid. So what determines the amount of damage in the different areas? Well, you know, of course, it's going to be the magnitude of the earthquake, and it's going to be how close you are to that earthquake, you know, the distance to the epicenter, but also how deep in the ground the earthquake occurred. Other factors are, you know, what building you're in, what is it constructed of, and has it been seismically re retrofit? So, you know, wood is gonna sustain better because it's more flexible than having a masonry or a brick building. Uh, the other thing is what type of material is that building built on? So is it bedrock or is it soil? Um, here in the valley, we're in unconsolidated soils. And what happens when the earthquake starts happening, it shakes, all those little soils start becoming, uh, they're not cemented together like bedrock. So they're gonna be moving more than a solid bedrock as opposed to up in the hills. Oh, no, I'll, I'll wait for that for later. So what might happen uh, in an earthquake here? Of course, uh, damages to home, business, businesses, bridges, overpasses, and you know we could have total collapse or they just, are declared unusable. Uh, injuries, casualties, people trapped. Um, there's a good chance that in a large earthquake that our roads are either gonna be cracked or buckled. There'll be debris in the roads such as buildings, um, trees, power lines and things like that. And because of all that, you know, our first responders may not be able to get to us or they're gonna be delayed in the, um, 2017 and the LNU fires that we had, it took six hours for people, for our first responders to respond to the 911 call. So if you look at back then, um, that wasn't even a total destruction for the county wide. So we have a higher potential and a large earthquake that impacts our county that um, our responders are not gonna get to us. Uh, medical facilities because of damage or because of how many injuries are going to be non-operational or overloaded. We could have disruptions of our utilities. A lot of these utilities are underground and when the earth starts shaking, those lines and pipes could be cracked. Um, because of that also, we can have fires. 
in 1906, the large earthquake in San Francisco, it was actually the fires after the earthquake that caused most of the damage. It wasn't actually the earthquake. Uh, communication disruption, and then also, you know, liquefaction, landslides, dam failures, and tsunamis can also occur. So what can we do to reduce potential risk to our families, to our homes? Uh, you start out by doing an assess of your own home garage, business where you live, and you get in the same mindset as you know we've talked about for wildfires. You walk around inside your house, you walk around outside. What are the potential scenarios that can happen and what can occur at your own house. So what you want to look for are things on the wall, what's hanging on the wall or uh, above, sitting above your cabinets that could fall off. And if they fall off, what are they going to hit potentially? Um, your appliances, your cabinets and things like that, what could damage inside and outside? Do you have um, potentially some flammable materials and things like that that you need to take care of. So you do that assessment to first, first off. And you're gonna also practice what the saying is for earthquakes is drop, cover, hold on. You practice that, especially with your children and older adults, because when an earthquake occurs, you may not have the time or be able to have that access to them when an earthquake occurs because you, we only have seconds to respond. So make sure that you know everyone in your family knows what to do if an earthquake occurs. And after you've done the assessment, you know, you go around, you, you take care of those things that are potential hazards, you know, secure the bookcases, the dressers, appliances, secure the cabinet doors so that they're not going to fly open and things in there can fall out. Uh, strap the water heater, that's very important because they're usually uh, gas and there's a potential fire for that. Uh, heavy objects or valuable things, you know, where are they stored? Can you store them somewhere else that they might be safer? Uh, and like I said, you know, the flammable materials, uh, not only where are they stored, but, you know, what containers are they stored in? Uh, you can install guards along shelves. You can also, I'll show you later, um, put some bungee cords on it to uh, prevent things from falling off. Um, consider retrofitting your house. I'm, I'm not going to go into much detail because I'm, I'm not an engineer on that part. But just to give you a little overview, you know, things that are not attached to your house properly in a big quake are likely going to uh, fall. Uh, you know, we often will attach a porch or an overhang over a patio and things like that. You know, if they're not seismically uh, built correct, they're, they're going to fall. The other uh, big consideration are chimneys, especially brick chimneys. You know, brick and masonry do not do well when it comes to earthquakes. And it's important to keep a pair of shoes and flashlight near your bed. And you know, we, we recommend this for, for all hazards because you never know when it's gonna occur. But especially in an earthquake, you know, an earthquake occurs, you know, your windows could be breaking, you could be in bed. So you may not have the chance, the opportunity to get to your shoes without walking on glass and other debris. And these are just some products that I wanted to show you that you know you can consider. I'm not promoting any one or any of these in particular, but these are different products to attach your cabinets and bookcases and things like that to the wall. You you know you want to attach it to a stud, something that's not going to come out. This here is museum putty, which is very good. I have used this to attach. Uh, put additional, um, secure my uh, paintings to my wall. Also um, things that I have sitting on top of my cabinet and things like that. If you're concerned about uh, your TV falling, there are special straps for connecting your TV to the base that it's sitting on. 
these three here are different types of, uh, they're basically just, you know, child proofing the cabinets. Um, so, you, you know, you determine what's going to work for you and what's there. Um, you know, some of the child proofing things, you know, if there's a large earthquake and you have something very heavy behind it, it may not stop it, but it's going to help, you know, any little bit, it's going to help decrease the, the impact. This here is a special product that you can actually buy um, to put around uh, shelving and things like that to keep them in place. Which, like I said, you can also use bungee cords on that. Uh, these are uh, actually just pictures of, of my house. And I would just want to use this to reiterate how important it is to strap your water heater correctly to the wall so that um, it doesn't fall, but also the lines don't become ruptured. This is a, one of the uh, child proofing ones that I use for cabinets in my garage. Here, uh, it's just an example of using rope and a bungee cord to keep things uh, up on the shelf. Down here uh, is an example of using that museum putty. And you know, I, I went through the process of what up there and other places in my house. Am I okay with it falling and breaking? To am I okay losing it? Yes, I am. I've decided that. Um, the other thing, though, to consider is, you know, those large vases. What are they going to fall on? Well, they potentially could put dents in my laminate flooring. Um, so I haven't quite decided if I'm comfortable with that one yet. I'm really probably not. Uh, so those are just kind of the thought process to, to go through in your own house. This is a bench in my garage where I, I keep my cleaning products and I put uh, just screwed in a board at the bottom to hold it in and put the bungee cord up there to keep the chemicals there and for them not to fall out. Um, on a side note, um, Never store uh, ammonia with chlorine products because you'll get ammonia chloride. Um, so uh, Windex, those type of things have ammonia. Bleach has the chlorine. And what to do during? Well, hopefully that you've gone through the process and you have already picked out uh, what desk you're gonna go in. Where is it? Um, safe for you to be in each room. Because when the earthquake happens, you're not going to be able to um, run into the other room. You don't run outside. You go wherever is close by. Because like I said, you will have seconds to respond. And because the, the house is going to be moving, um, walking is not going to be possible. Most people actually get hurt because of movement they're trying to get somewhere and that's when they get hurt so when it happens when you feel it you get into uh under the desk you drop cover hold on and you hold on to the legs of the furniture because the furniture is going to want to move it'll walk with the movement and you want to stay under there you're covering yourself And if uh, you or someone you know actually are in a wheelchair or a walker, so instead of drop cover hold on, you lock it or on the, um, and on the walker, we would sit in the chair and then you cover your head. If you uh, have determined that there's no appropriate furniture in a room to get under, the next best thing is going to be sitting against a wall. So an interior wall, not the outside wall. And you're going to be at least 15 feet away from windows, but also look above and around. Uh, is there a chandelier above you that might fall? Is there uh, a mirror that's nearby that could fall? So choose something that is going to be safe, an area or, um, just yeah, whatever is going to be the safest for you. So, and I do want to let you know that you know there was the old um, saying of get in the doorway. 
well, that's not appropriate. It hasn't been appropriate actually for a long time. And that came from when housing were um, Adobe. Doorways are not any structurally more sound than the rest of the house. And in a doorway, uh, you have the door that's flying. So you can actually get more, you can get more, more hurt. You can get hurt more um, from the door hitting you than the earthquake. Uh, if you're in bed, what you want to do is you stay there and you curl up, cover your head with the pillow. And if for some reason it's a large quake and you get trapped um, under a lot of debris, you best to stay there and cover your mouth. There's going to be a lot of dust and things going on. If you have your phone, you can send a text or you can tap on something if you hear people nearby. If you're outside, you know, the, the same general thing applies. You want to stay away from anything that might fall on you. So trees, buildings, power lines, you get in an open area, sit down and, and cover your head. If you're in a car and you feel the, an earthquake, you pull over as soon as you can to a safe place. And they also, you know, like I said before, it's always, you know, away from power lines, light poles, trees, and things like that. And also do not park under an overpass, you know, any, or a bridge, anything like that. Anything that could fall, you stay out of it. So once you're uh, parked in the car, you stay in the car with your seat belt on. When the earthquake ends, you drive cautiously looking for possible dangers of bridges, trees that might fall and things like that. What to do after? Um, well, to start with, expect aftershocks because they're more than likely going to happen. And each time you're gonna go through the same process of drop, cover, and hold on. But after the earthquake stops and it's safe, you know, assess your house and see what has happened. Uh, be careful though, because like this picture shows, there could be a lot of debris and broken glass around. So when you clean, end up starting to clean up, be very careful, wear gloves and things like that. Um, in your assessment, you know, you're checking to see if there are any fires that have started or, you know, the gas lines, any potential fires, and you take care of those. If there's a large fire, you know, just get out and call 911. Uh, if there is, you know, you smell the gas or you think it might be leaking, you should shut it off. If there's a, or you fear that there's a chance that the house may collapse or even part of it, go ahead and get outside, you know, call for help. But once you've done the whole assessment of, you know, is your family, okay, is the house okay, then go check on your neighbors. The other thing is, um, you know, once, you know, the, the uh, critical time has uh, passed where you're sure things are safe, then start checking your emergency alerts, the radio station, see what's finding out, what's going on out there. Um, when you start cleaning up, you know, there's a good chance that things have shifted inside cabinets and when you open them they're going to fall out so make sure that you know you're not in the way when something's falling on you you know we need to have the emergency kits accessible which i'll talk about um, those later um, don't use an elevator and just like other emergencies you know we, we've always been told uh, in a wildfire when you're getting ready to evacuate you know pull your car out of the garage park it so it's facing the road and load supplies because you never know um, what might be happening next. So I wanna talk a little bit about my Shake app. Um, you may or may not heard of this. This is an early warning notice for earthquakes greater than 4.5. Um, it's kind of like, um, you can, you can kind of compare it to pulse point and watch duty, but it's a little different. And I want everyone to understand the limitations of this compared to the other ones. You know, there, there's no disadvantage to having this on your phone. 
Um, it is very good when it goes off and you can get under something very uh, quick, but um, this is not going to give you an early notice like what we get with the wildfires. We're talking seconds here, tens of seconds. So if this alert goes off on your phone and your phone's across the room, you don't have time to go get your phone, look at it and find out what's going on and things like that. The phone um, alert goes off. You need to respond fast. You need to get under your safe, into your safe spot. Uh, the other thing is uh, the USGS did this blind zone of earthquake uh, warning and what they found out because of the delay in um, information from the earthquake to the phone, basically, um, there's an area where um, people weren't, people weren't notified. So what happens is earthquake happens, it goes to the seismographs, you know, they record, it goes to UC Berkeley, they do their analysis, their analysis, then it goes out to Wi-Fi, to your phone service, it comes to you, you know, that is fast, but when we're talking seconds for an earthquake to get to your house, you know, it could be faster than what the alert system is capable of doing, at least for now. Uh, the study determined that in the area where there was the highest destruction, the alert came after the earthquake hit already. So um, it is a good uh, source for early warning but it's don't rely completely on it. That's what I'm saying. It does have its limitations. When an earthquake hits, you know, chances are we're not going to be doing an evacuation. We're going to be sheltering in place. Uh, it's not, uh, if we you evacuate, it's going to be an individual here or there, and it's not going to be an evacuation like a wildfire where you have to get out. You're, you're trying to outrun something. Most of the time, uh, as those pictures showed, you know, there's destruction all around you. You're stuck sheltering in place because roads are blocked, and there's no, basically, there, there might not be any support around you for a few days. And that's where COPE groups are very critical. And COPE, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about COPE later, but COPE stands for Citizens Organized to Prepare for Emergencies. And it's about neighbors helping neighbors. So in a shelter in place that you're there because of a major earthquake, you're gonna to have to rely on each other to help. Uh, for sheltering in place, what they recommend is when you're in an urban area that you have at least seven days supply of food and water. And if you're in remote areas, uh, 14 days, because it could just take longer to clear areas to get out to into the remote areas. I'm gonna go over uh, some of this, but a lot of these details are in um, the COPE Emergency Preparedness Guidebook, which I'll give you the link uh, a little later. And it's also on uh, socoemergency.org's website. So let's just take, you know, the town of Windsor, we're in an urban area. So seven days, we need water, a, a gallon per person per day. And I've added this over here, this image. This is a water brook. Uh, I have some of those, they are excellent in storing water. They hold 3.5 gallons and you can see, you know, it's wedged so that they stack next to each other. And you can store these uh, under your bed. You can store them uh, behind a couch and things like that. So instead of, you know, some people I know have actually 55 gallon drums that, that take up uh, a large area. These are very easy and you can, uh, they, uh, the water you can store in for six months. And if you're evacuating, you can grab one of these and this could be your water that you're taking also. 
So food, you know, you get food with a long expiration date, canned and packaged for your foods. You make sure you have the utensils, can opener, everything in, in your emergency supply kit. And you're, you know, you're gonna keep this kit in an area that you think is going to be accessible if there's an earthquake. They, you know, do recommend sometimes, you know, you put in a watertight container outside, you know, maybe in your shed, in your garage, and things like that. Uh, and the reason that that you have this extra stuff in there, you know, you may be thinking, well, I'm home, I'm at the house, but if most of the house is inaccessible because there's so much debris, you know, the ceiling has collapsed and things like that. You want everything in this emergency supply kit. So that's why at least one change of clothing for every person, you know, you're, you're cooking utensils, pots, pans, you know, a stove, the barbecue, you know, if you can't uh, shelter in your house anymore, you know, do you have a tent, sleeping bags, a, a tarp that you can just put above, all the medical supplies that you might need, uh, some things for lighting, lighting, you know, flashlights, lanterns, things like that. And a radio. Uh, best to have something that's hand cranked, solar battery operated, a NOAA weather radio, like this one here. Um, you can get some that are not that expensive. I think this one is. $40 and they do their multi-purpose. So this has like a flat besides those, it has a flashlight and it can charge your phone also. So any support supplies, bags, gloves, things like that, to your toiletries, you know, small bills, at least a hundred dollars, you know, and some of this is the same exact same thing that we say for wildfires and other um, situations. Uh, have a respirator with you, uh, make sure that you have everything for your pets also in that kit. And uh, Halter Project, uh, which we work with also, you know, Julie recommends uh, for 10 to 15 days supply for your animals, not just the, the seven days. So everything that you need, your pets are gonna need also. Uh, any of your documents that you might need, copies of, tools, uh, especially um, over here, um, your gas wrench to shut it off, have that handy, um, matches, fire extinguishers, things like that. Uh, there are details, like I said, in our guidebook and then on SoCo Emergency. But besides having this kit at home, you know, think about having a smaller version at where you, your business, where you work, and then also in your vehicle. So if an earthquake or another disaster hits and you're at work or you're in your vehicle, what are you going to need uh, until you are capable of getting somewhere safe. And um, our guidebook also has a list of different things for the workplace supply kit and the vehicle supply kit. We have these two handouts that, you know, um, kind of break this down into really general, you know, prepare for earthquake and, and what to do during an earthquake. Those are accessible to everyone. And this is just some uh, just selected resources that you can go to if you want. Uh, some that I want to point out uh, down here is our Sonoma County Hazard Mitigation Plan. If you want to know uh, more risks that we have in our area, you can go to this plan. They do have um, other maps that I didn't show. So if there's an earthquake on the Rogers Creek Fault. They have a map, the area map, where they expect um, the different risks of damage to, to happen. Um, this here is an assessment of the Hayward Fault. Uh, if the Hayward Fault, the major fault uh, earthquake happens on that, Sonoma County is gonna be impacted also. So it does extend into maybe half of Sonoma County in, in its uh, little scenario that it assesses. Uh, 
you've all probably heard that, that we do have earthquake insurance available to us. If you're interested in that, you can go here. Um, it is expensive, but it's an individual risk that you know we all need to determine what we're comfortable with. Uh, this is the link for the emergency preparedness guidebook that is specifically for Windsor, if you're not familiar with it. Um, I do recommend that you download it. It's 85 pages long. It has maps for Windsor, it has phone numbers for Windsor, and it goes through um, what to do before, during, after a wildfire, uh, floods, earthquakes, and things like that. It has all the information for, you know, preparing your plan and uh, what to do, details of how to assist your uh, pets. So that concludes the, the talk on the uh, earthquake portion. I just want to give you um, some information about COPE. Uh, so Windsor COPE is uh, throughout um, Windsor now, and COPE is part of a bigger program. It was actually started many years ago in Sonoma County by Oakmont with assistance from um, Santa Rosa Fire Department and American Red Cross. And since then it's spread out. You know, we have uh, numerous COPE groups throughout everywhere. Um, Windsor COPE is part of COPE Northern Sonoma County. And uh, a, a year ago, we had over 45 groups just within uh, Northern Sonoma County. And it's, like I said, it's built on neighbors helping neighbors. It's helping you get together with your neighbors, know your neighbor, you know, where are your resources? So when you shelter in place, is there a nurse nearby? Um, who has the construction material you may need to, you know, help someone that's, that's trapped? Um, but at the same time, you also learn who in your neighborhood um, might need additional help you know is there elderly people in your neighborhood is there someone who um, might need help evacuating because they have uh, mobility issues and things like that so the coke program you know it, it's about neighbors helping neighbors but there's also a communication dissemination portion that is extremely helpful so I, as the community leader, am part of Cope Northern Sonoma County's leadership. And I, I attend monthly meetings there, which also includes fire officials, um, Sonoma County Emergency Management, a, a lot of people in that, in that group. Uh, information comes down through uh, GroupMe, which is a, an app for messaging. And some of the fire officials will be out on a fire and they're posting to us uh, what's happening on the fires, giving us current information. So what happens is I take that information and I give it to uh, Windsor Cope neighborhood leaders. And our neighborhood leaders uh, oversee 10 to 20 residences. And the information that you know I get, I send to the neighborhood leaders. They disseminate and they go down to their own to the neighbors. So there's a whole um, program that is set in place. Uh, like I said, you know, we are and we also are looking for more neighborhood leaders. So if you yourself want to be one, or if uh, one of your neighbors would be a, a good neighborhood leader, uh, please contact me. And what you're doing, basically, you're just the liaison between your neighbors and then uh, myself and uh, Angelica, who is our bilingual uh, neighborhood leader. Information that we give you, you just pass on. You're, you're, you're there helping. You'd have meetings with each other, coordinate and things like that. And what can you do? Um, get, how, to, how can you get ready? So download our guidebook. Um, we have down here, there is um, on Google Drive, we have different resources there, those two handouts on our earthquake um, 
information is there. The guidebooks there. We also have replays from every um, monthly meeting that we've done. And for those of you who don't know, you know, Windsor Cope is a collaborative effort between the town of Windsor, uh, um, Sonoma County Fire District and Windsor Police. And we have given three workshops to the town already um, to help the town get prepared. So those replays are also on um, our YouTube channel, which is, the link is down here. You can um, sign up to be a leader, um, but if you know you want to just contact me, I can help you with that. You can uh, email at cope at townofwindsor.com. That goes to me. This is our uh, webpage on the townofwindsor.com uh, website. If you want to get on our email, I mean, I actually will put you on our email to get notices uh, of future monthly meetings or workshops that we end up doing also. So that ends the PowerPoint presentation. And at this point, you know, I, I want to open it up to uh, questions, uh, comments, things like that. And you are welcome to either, you know, unmute yourself or, and I will check to see if uh, there are any questions in the chat. So anyone want to have questions, you can unmute yourself. I have a question. As we're getting, um, with all this COVID stuff going around, is it advisable to try to do an outdoor activity oh, yeah. to yeah, try to get all of our neighbors so. together and get on board Six doing this? Slipper, man, so you can um, Heather? Fireplace? Yes. Fireplace? Did, oh. did you hear my question? I'm surprised. Uh, what, not 16? all of it because someone else is Hold on. unmuted and talking. Okay. So, so my question is, um, even with this, with all the COVID stuff going on, do you recommend that we try to do an outdoor meeting like a neighborhood barbecue or just an outside sit and circle with chairs, you know, to, to talk about who has what I know people are just kind of anxious about getting together and, you know, talking about what they have because of COVID. That's all. Yeah. Uh, it's going to depend on your neighbors. Um, you could try doing a zoom call. I haven't uh, tried getting my neighbors together to see how they feel. Uh, some people are not going to want to. I know that. Uh, you might want to wait, you know, another month and see how the situation is. Thanks. And uh, Heather, if you uh, organize it, we'll do it at my house. This is Mike Merrill. That sounds awesome. Perfect idea. <laughs> I, I knew you'd go for that. <laughs> okay, so there's a couple of comments in here. Uh, one is, you know, if you use the museum putty, uh, be careful when you take it off because it can take some of the sheetrock. Um, yes, I know that. I've done that. I have a little spot up there that I don't have any more paint left. I need to cover up. So... It, it, it can, you, you need to, when you take the putty off, you, you need to twist. There's a certain way that you need to, to do it. Um, uh, someone else commented that we can use the water in our water heaters um, if we need to. Uh, still recommend filtering or boiling it. Uh, yeah, you, you can. Um, but it's also depends on, you know, hopefully nothing happened to your water heater either. You know, I, I'm not going to rely on, on my water heat, my water heater, but you, yes, you can do that. You can also, if you needed to, you, for different things, there's the water in the tank and the toilet in the back part of it. There's water in there also.
Um, someone says uh, a great podcast is the big one, a dramatization of a big earthquake in LA. There are three episodes produced by KPCC Public Radio in Southern California. Uh, anyone else? You know, you're you're welcome. This this time is just an open discussion. So you're welcome to talk about anything uh, emergency related. It doesn't even have to be earthquakes. So. One of the things that we don't always think about is the sewage system, the sewer system, and whether it will be functioning. And I remember going to a museum in Christchurch, New Zealand, after they had had two earthquakes within um, a year, big ones, and they had a big competition and they were displaying some of the uh, artwork, I guess you'd call it, in their museum. It was called the Big Drop, and people made toilets that they you know artistic toilets that i guess they used out in their yards i'm not sure somebody made one out of a motorcycle and but that's just drawing attention that that's something that will need to be uh, um, accommodated you know especially if we go for weeks without facilities so there's uh, a just yeah, think so about. there's a good good chance uh that a sewer system might piping might break. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in your kit, make sure you have a shovel. Yeah, a lot of toilet paper <laughs> and whatever. A bucket. Uh, a question here was, do P, P waves actually travel faster than S waves? Yes, they actually do travel faster. And they do they travel different. Move the movement. So uh, P wave, uh, if it's traveling this way, the movement's this way. The S wave's traveling this way, the movement's going back and forth type of thing. So then, Diana, the timing difference between the arrival of a P wave and an S wave depends not only on their separation at the initiation of the event, but also on the distance that they have to travel. Is that right? Yes. Okay, and we commonly think about the uh, Hillsburg extension of the Rogers Creek Fault as being an area that runs along the western side of the Foothill area of Windsor, um, just up by Foothill Park and then running real crudely north and south. Is that roughly correct? Mm, you know, I'd have to take a look at the map, tell you the truth. I if you look at the maps, it, it seems to indicate that that's where it is. And of course, there's an abrupt discontinuation in the geology running from a plain into the foothills. So I think a lot of people have just wondered if that might be the little tectonic junction right there. When I was in college, you know, they would refer to Hillsborough Rogers Creek Fault kind of as one that there they are, there is some connection between the zone, fault zones there. Um, but when I was looking recently, um, they were looking at possibly the Rogers Creek and the Hayward one being more um, associated. So I'd have I'm to look sorry, could you, could you say that again, please? The Rogers Creek Fault and the Hayward Fault, which is south of the Rogers Creek Fault. Yep, yep. So they were talking about how that is uh, an extension. So they were talking, so when they were given a probability of an earthquake happening on the Hayward Fault, they were including the Rogers Creek Fault in it. So I okay. would have to look to see what the, the current thought is on um, the fault zones, Hayward, Rogers Creek, and Healdsburg. Are they thinking what, you know, what is connected? What's a continuation of? of the others and what's actually a separate zone. Yeah, really helpful statistic or uh, predictive um, percentage would be the likelihood that there is a quake that occurs on the, uh, what we used to call, maybe don't call it anymore, the Healdsburg extension of the Rogers Creek Fault. And if that really is uh, running just along the foothills, which of course is a largely residential area in Windsor. Um, some of the maps that have been published that show um, shaking scenarios 
do show a line running roughly in that area. And then they also show um, intense shaking predicted for the area right around there. And then of course, less shaking as you get over towards 101 and finally far less severe shaking when you're on the west side of 101. So it just makes it sound like that's a, a potentially really active area. And there's been a lot of discussion in some of the neighborhoods about that. So if, if that could be clarified, I think that'd be really helpful. It's something that COPE could kind of put out to people and let them know, yeah, this Mute. is the way it is, or well, no, it's not exactly like that. Mute my auto. Mute it. Now you're unmuted. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at it and let you know, Bill. I Thanks suggest you go, you go look at the Sonoma County Multi-Jurisdictional Hazard mitigation plan, the HMP that I, I mentioned, I gave the, the link to. It's um, one that's not, the, the current HMP is gonna end sometime this year, and then the, that one's gonna kick in. And they go through an assessment in detail that might answer your question. Like I said, they have map, like a map for the Rogers Creek Hillsburg, the Rogers Creek Fault, the area of, you know, highest potential, moderate potential, low potential impact and things like that. I think you'll find a lot of the information in um, the what's gonna be the current HMP. Thank you. Uh, wanna know my thoughts on earthquake insurance. Well, I got it about two years ago because, you know, I, I felt earthquake, earthquake, uh, the earth in general was talking to us more and more. You know, we were getting more landslides. We were getting more earthquakes. We were, I'm talking worldwide planet. Um, and things were happening more around here. Uh, I never had it up until a couple of years ago. And I, I did decide to get it. Uh, like I said, it's a personal thing of um, how much you're comfortable with the risk factor. It's not, it doesn't cover, you know, um, it's expensive and it does have a big deductible. But what you're, I'm looking for, you know, if it's a large it's earthquake and that's where, it's, well, that's when it's going to kick in. And that's when I'm going to feel uh, very glad that I had it. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay, well, if there aren't any other uh, questions or comments, then I will thank you all for attending. Um, I do not have right now a monthly meeting set up for next month. Um, it's you always been the third Tuesday of each month at six o'clock. So what I would like to hear is from you. Um, what do you want to hear about? What do you What do you guys want to know about emergency related? You know, we we've covered um, zero to five foot zone for wildfires, communications, um, go bags for you and your pets. Can we Can uh, we talk about water purification? Okay. Because you just never know. What if the water out of the pipes is no good or shut off or whatever, you know? Okay, I can add that. Anything else? I mean, any anything emergency related? Someone said flooding in the area. Okay. Oh, I didn't see that. Thanks, Susan. In the chat. And as far as water purification, maybe a camp stove, you know, so that you can boil water in case your stove doesn't work. Uh, and you can also always buy um, purification kits. You know, they have them when you're for backpacking and things like that. I mean, there, there are things designed just, just for that but I can take a look at, um, you know, larger volume type of a thing if there's available. 
Diana, we still have a number of people in our neighborhood who don't have cell phones. And I remember you pointed out recently that one emergency notification service could actually go to a landline, whereas the other is required a cell phone. If you could just put something out about that again, that might be something that would drum up some support for thinking about community organization. If uh, you know those of us who are leaders could uh, disseminate that to the neighborhood. I've, I've already told a few people about that. Um, it'd just be nice to get that out in an official form because I know there are people who don't have cell phones, don't have emergency notification, probably thought unless they had a cell phone, they wouldn't get it. Yeah, yeah SoCo emergency, you can, uh, that will contact landlines, which is so, sorry, it's SoCo alert. That's where it comes from. <laughs> Um, so Danica said she wanted an updated COPE leadership uh, meeting, uh, Windsor COPE. Um, so to let you everyone know if you're not uh, already familiar with, so Windsor has a resiliency plan that's draft right now. Uh, it went out for public review and they're incorporating the, the comments. And in there, uh, Windsor COPE was mentioned a lot. Uh, like almost 50 times. Um, so when that is final next month, it's going to go to our town council, you know, that may change the whole COPE program. In there, they even recommended the town eventually get a um, neighborhood group coordinator for to oversee the help with the COPE, HOAs and things like that. So uh, my, my guess is the whole program is, is going to expand a little bit and how that's going to play out. I'm not quite sure yet. So if, uh, Danica, you know, um, I'll wait to know, um, work with the town to figure out how that plan is actually going to be implemented. You know, but uh, at some point, yeah, we'll, we'll have an updated meeting. Well, I, I thank you everyone. And I will let you know um, when our next meeting is and what that it's about. So take care and good night.